Hi, and welcome to the Daybreak Show. I am Juliet Mausi, your host, and today I have with me Dr. Efwa Kupa, a social justice advocate, a poet, and activist, to discuss about the impact her work is making on the community. Thank you, Dr. Fruva, for joining me today. Uh, you're welcome. Great. So um, you, you had an interview with CBC recently. Yeah. And you made a statement that everybody has a story to tell. So I'm going to ask you, what is the story for being an activist and also a poet? Oh, <laughs> well, the story there is that you, or I should say I, draw from what's happening in society. Uh, first, I look at my own place in society and my own role in society. What's the role I play? Who am I? What's my um, subjectivity? Uh, so I'm, I'm a poet, I'm a professor, I'm a historian. Um, I'm fiercely passionate about education and about social justice. So coming from my various standpoints, I jump off into these, into these issues. Um, so if there's an origin to the story, I would say um, that origin lies in my upbringing, um, my heritage and my parentage, Bo both my parents, my mom and dad from Jamaica. I was born in Jamaica in the Caribbean. Um, both of them were community activists. And even as a little child, I remember my mother taking me to meetings. It could be um, women's meetings, it could be meetings about community development and, and she would roll out a blanket on the floor somewhere and, and we would sleep because we were little kids and uh, you get tired and fall asleep but she would take us to, to those meetings and to those places so I think I would say I was actually like born with that in my blood. My mother had a strong sense of justice and, um, and, and didn't like to see wrong done to people and she tried in her own way to make a difference in our community. Oh, so I would say it runs in the family then. Yeah, it runs in my family. And as long as I can remember, I've had this desire to use what I have, to use my skills and my talents and my knowledge, um, not only for myself and my own family, but for those around me as best as I can. So what has been your major inspiration for writing your books? Uh, it, you know, again, it goes back to, I think they said everything is kind of set in your life by the time you're 12. I'm not sure about that. But um, growing up in Kingston, Jamaica, um, growing up in a working class environment, I was very exposed to, to um, culture and to music and to history and to the Rastafari movement. And there was this sense that black Jamaicans was, um, by and large, was oppressed by the system, right? Whatever that system is, the political system. So I grew up in a context where people felt that there was a lot of wrong done to the citizens of the community and that these wrongs stemmed from the colonial days from slavery. So for example, I grew up hearing that the, the Queen or the British monarchy owed black people 20 million pounds. Couldn't figure that out as a little kid until I went to high school and did history. And, and, and that 20 million pounds um, was the, the people who talked about that were referring to the compensation that the British government gave to the slave owners at the time of emancipation in 1834 and not to the slaves. So slavery ended, they said, okay, you guys are free, good luck, have a nice life. But they gave nothing. They gave them nothing after 300 years of free labor. But they compensated the slave masters to the tune of 20 million pounds for losing their property because enslaved people were considered property. So I grew up hearing that, and it wasn't until I went to high school and I did a history course on the history of the Caribbean that he said, ah, oh, that 20 million pounds is a compensation money. So I'm saying to say, I, it, it was everywhere around me. I also grew up at a time in the 70s when 
um, reggae music became extremely popular. It was the music of Jamaica, and you had people like Bob Marley and so on gaining international fame. So I always felt that the key to my understanding as a human being, um, that, that key, the door to open, uh, the, the door, th that one which had to open was the door of history. Mm. That's what I always felt. And so, so I pursued that my whole life. Mm. So as a social justice advocate, mm -hmm. um, what, how do we see it to be justice in a community, um, looking at the brutality and then mm -hmm. the unfair treatment people go through? Yeah, well, it, this is where I think everybody has to be engaged in whatever it is that uh, you know, people are trying to change. So everybody from civil society, because oftentimes we hold up the politicians as the one to, to make the change, right? And we forget that politicians are public servants, that we are the ones who elect them. And so, you know, oftentimes we get really resigned and we said, oh, nothing's gonna change, these politicians are all corrupt. But hey, wait a minute, we voted for them. And so we have the responsibility to hold politicians accountable. But at the same time, the commun that's why we have these various civil society groups, women's groups, church groups, youth groups, journalist groups, right? So we, are, we, are all, we all should be invested because it's our society. That's why we call our countries, whichever country it is, the commonwealth. The wealth belongs to the people, whichever way we define the wealth. The wealth is, um, should be a common thing for everybody. It's not just a group of people that owns the wealth of society. It's every, everybody, even the person who is not working, because we often tend to look down on people who are unemployed or people who are homeless or whatever. But everybody has a right to the wealth of the country or, or the city or the state or whatever it is, just by virtue of our existing because each person in intrinsically has dignity, has human dignity. And based on that fact, then everyone is entitled to the commonwealth. Hmm. So um, as an activist, what, how will you say the difference between feminism and, and um, gender equality is? I don't think there is a difference. I think feminism from the get-go, um, one of its principal goals um, was to have gender equality. Uh, and um, maybe, well, yeah, I, I, I would say that. But also to, to center the experience and the realities of women's lives, right? And still bearing in mind the intersection, like not all women are equal. What I mean by that is some women have more access to certain resources than other women, just like men, right? Some people have more wealth, some people have more education, some people have more clothes. Um, but at the same time, if we can think about uh, common experiences that all women have, you know, I think many women, all women if not many women, have this experience of fear, of fear walking in, in the night. Right? I think women are hyper sensitive during the night, during the dark, um, to certain realities, right? So um, feminism or feminist, all feminists envision a society in which women can walk or drive without fear, without we having to be looking over our shoulders all the time. And we do that as a result of patriarchal violence. So I myself see a society where um, women are centered, where children are centered, where the, the, um, the needs of women and children are centered, down to w the way how we design washrooms, for example. Like this, this campus, you guys do architecture here. Why do m men and women have the same amount of stalls? Like women need more stalls. And we need stalls where you have a, a, a baby tray, because oftentimes women have babies and they need to change the diapers. Or we need to create buildings that has a room where women can breastfeed, for example. 
So it's like taking the needs of women and children and putting them at the center. I firmly believe in that. No, okay. That's all the time we have for today. Okay. Thank you so much for coming. Oh, you're welcome. And thank you so much for watching. <laughs> Tune in next time for the same episode. Thank you.